If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to, if you could, turn with me to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 5. A familiar story to a lot of us. I want to talk this morning a little bit about faith and religion. Uh, faith and religion. Some people think that's the same thing, but it's not. In fact, religion is as opposite from faith as you can get. If you can walk in religion or you can walk in faith, you know, I hate it when people say, you know, when you get saved, people say, well, he got religion. I hate that. I lost my religion. When I came, when I came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and I came to the liberty of understanding the gift of the blood of Jesus that was shed for the forgiveness of my sins, that I no longer had to work for my salvation. And I no longer had to feel condemned because I wasn't doing enough, or I wasn't doing well enough, or I wasn't producing enough, or I wasn't... When I finally came to that point to understand that my salvation is not based on my performance, but based on what He did, and all I needed to do was put my faith in what he did on the cross. See, it's simple, but it's not always easy. As a matter of fact, for us as human beings, we always try to do everything. We always try to fix everything. Especially men, they always want to try to fix everything. Some things are better left unfixed, right? But we always want to try. If something isn't, it just isn't right, we want to try to throw some stuff in and well, we're going, to make it, we're going to make it our own. Listen, the only way that we can make Christ our own is through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. It's simple. It's not always easy. There's a story here in chapter 5 of 2 Kings. I gave this message about a month ago uh, over at uh, the high rise. So those of you that heard it, you can take a nap. Okay. Uh, you've heard it already. Uh, it's a story about a fellow named Naaman and about a prophet named Elisha. Now, one of my favorite people in all of the Old Testament is the prophet Elijah. Okay, if you know anything about the prophet Elijah, and I've done some, some messages on him. And uh, Elijah, James says he was a man of like passions, just like us. That makes me feel pretty good because Elijah did some pretty miraculous things. Through the hand of God, obviously. He didn't do them himself, but he was a prophet of God, and he did miracles. He was the one that called the fire down on Mount Carmel. If you remember, there was seven years of, of drought, and uh, at the end of that seven years, they had the great contest on Mount Carmel where there were hundreds of priests of Baal and uh, Ashtoreth, and uh, there was Elijah who was all by himself, and they set up the two sacrifices, and uh, the, the, Baal and Ash, uh, the, the priests of Baal and Asherah tried to call down fire from heaven and nothing ever happened. And Elijah said, well, you know, maybe your God is he's sleeping or maybe he's taking a nap or maybe he's just not available right now. Uh, and when Elijah said, Lord, you know, show who you are, and the fire came down and took up both the sacrifice and everything. Great miracle on Mount Carmel. You can read about it. And, 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 and then right after that, Elijah figured that there would be a great revival in in Israel, and instead Jezebel, who was the queen at that time, threatened to kill him. So he ran and he hid and he got all despondent and he ran in, into a, a cave somewhere and, uh, you know, the, the still small voice came. And you know the story, okay? He, he, he felt that he was the only one standing up for God. God told him, I have thousands more than you and so forth. So Elijah kind of, he's dear to my heart because the, things, the kind of things he felt are the kind of things I feel sometimes. Even as uh, Sister Donna was singing, sometimes you think, you know, can you find somebody else to do this? Maybe, you know, maybe you can find somebody else to do this. But if God called you, you know what? He didn't make any mistake. When God saved you, he didn't make a mistake. He knew who you were before he saved you. Okay, now, that's Elijah. And I'm not here to speak about Elijah this morning. But when Elijah, he was one of the few people, only him and Enoch were the only ones who were, t who, who were taken up, who were raptured without dying. And when Elijah was raptured without dying, what he did was he had an understudy. He had a, a helper named Elisha. And 
when Elijah was taken up, Elisha said, hey, listen, I want what you got, and I want a double portion. So Elijah said, well, listen, that's not up to me, but if when I'm taken up and the mantle falls upon you, you put it on, you'll get a double portion of my anointing. And that's what happened. Elijah, you know, Elijah was taken up, the mantle fell down, Elisha put it on, and if you count, you can count, he did twice as many miracles that Elijah did. You can count them in the, in the Old Testament, at least recorded miracles anyway, all right. He got a double portion. But Elisha had kind of a different personality than Elijah. He was, when I read it, my impression of it is Elijah was a very passionate, you know, on fire guy. Elisha was all business. He was business for the Lord. He knew his anointing. He knew what he, what he had to do, and he did it. And in chapter 5, we read a story about a guy named Naaman. And let's just read a little bit, and we'll, and we'll get into the story. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of, Assy of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. We'll stop there. Here was this guy named Naaman who was a mighty general, a valiant man, one who was one of the king's favors because he was a valiant warrior. He had won many battles. But there was a problem. Because at the very end of that verse it says, but he was a leper. Now that term leper, we all know, and again if you read God's word, read his Old Testament and New Testament, leprosy has always been a type of what? Sin. It's a disease, but it's a type of sin. It always represented sin. And leprosy in the Bible, if you go through the Old Testament laws of Moses that God gave to Moses in the first five books of the Bible, lepers were, were outcasts. They were to be separated from, from all the rest of the people because they felt that leprosy was contagious. They didn't know what caused it. There was no cure for it. And it was like a lifelong thing. And it was a degenerative disease. When you, uh, you, it, would, it would start with like a spot on your skin and it would begin to spread. And they say people with leprosy will actually, could actually lose their fingers. They will fall off because it eats away at their, at, their, at their body. So leprosy was a dreaded disease and there was no cure for it. And here was name and he was a valiant man. He could have been on the cover of Time magazine. But he was a leper. So... While he had a position, and while he was no, uh, uh, seen as being a great man, everybody had to keep their distance because he was a leper. That's a picture of what sin does. See, it's not the outside of the man. It's not what we do. It's that sin nature that possesses us, that makes us unacceptable in the eyes of God. Okay. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, the Syrians, if, again, if you read through the Old Testament in this area, the Syrians and the Israelites were at odds with each other. Just imagine that. <laughs> Just like they are today. But they were at odds with, with each other. And they were, there were all these, these little skirmishes and battles. And sometimes the Syrians would come and capture cities. And sometimes the Israelites would go and take them back. And there were all these little skirmishes. Well, at one of these skirmishes, the Syrians captured some people. And amongst these people was this, this, this little Israelite girl. And it says in verse 3, And she said unto her mistress. Now, we don't know who this woman was, this little girl. We know that she was... Uh, being a servant, a slave, she was captured, and she was a, 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 mis a, a servant to the, to the wife of Naaman. We don't know her name. We don't know anything about her, and we never hear about her again. But here we're going to start seeing the difference between faith and religion, okay? Because this little girl had faith. Faith speaks the promise. It speaks the promise. In verse 3, she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were, the pro uh, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. This little girl, we don't know her name. She wasn't a high priestess. She wasn't anybody famous. But she had enough faith to believe that there was a prophet in Israel who was able to cure Naaman of his leprosy. Not that the prophet himself had power, but there was a prophet of God who had power. God is over leprosy. He has all power. So... She said this to her mistress, 
And in verse 4, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Somebody went to Naaman and said, Listen, Naaman said that there's this prophet in Israel that can heal you of your leprosy. Okay. Verse 5. And the king of Syria, obviously Naaman went to the king and asked permission to go look for this prophet. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and uh, 6,000 pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Naaman came equipped to be able to buy his healing, to pay the man of God to heal him. You see, religion has a price tag on everything. If you want to be religious, there's a price tag on everything. It might not be money. It might be something else. But religion has strings attached to everything. Now, yesterday... I just want to tell you this. I, we went up to Teen Challenge, okay, because it's our, it was our day to, to minister up at Teen Challenge. And uh, I got in the van yesterday morning. I went down. I went to Sheets to buy some coffee. I went to get myself a coffee, one for Albert, because I was going to pick him up. And as I was walking back to the van, I tripped and fell and, and landed on my knee. Okay, so now, uh, I, you know, I hurt my knee. So uh, we went to Teen Challenge. I came back. I had it x-rayed. It's okay. But it basically laid me up for the rest of the day. Okay, so I'm stuck at home. So I started to read a little bit, and I just couldn't get my mind wrapped around because my knee was hurting, blah, blah. so I figured I'll just watch some TV, okay? So I sit down, and I don't watch a lot of TV. Rose and I, we watch some, and I don't watch a lot of religious TV, but I thought, well, if I get on there, maybe I'll, somebody will be preaching something. I went on. We have the Dish Network, okay? It has about eight religious channels, eight Christian channels, religious channels, whatever. You know, out of those eight channels, six of them was asking me for money. Now, now listen, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I mean, I've heard, I've heard, I, I heard the word so, so many times, and not S-E-W, but S-O-W, going through these channels. So there was the $333 Jeremiah seed, and there was the $1,000 Gideon seed, and there was a $500, you know, all these, to sow your seed into a good, oh, man, there's so many good grounds you could sow your seed into, I'd be broke in about 15 minutes. There's a price tag and a string attached to everything when it comes to religion. Everything, everything got, a, got a tag to it. So Naaman, who was a religious man, figured, I better load up. Healing leprosy is a big deal, so I better load up. So he, he had all this money and these garments. Man, he was ready. He had the letter from the king. And where did he go? He brought this letter. He didn't, he didn't go to the prophet because he didn't know where he was. So where did he go? He went to the person he thought would be the one to be able to tell him what to do. He went to the king of Israel, the guy who was in charge. He said, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant to thee, and that, that thou mayst recover him of his leprosy. Well, can you just imagine being the king of Israel? This time it was a fellow named Joram, who was the son of Ahab, who was uh, wicked. They were, they were all wicked kings in the northern kingdom. They were all tor- terrible kings. So he got this letter from the king of Syria saying, Heal my servant of his leprosy. And the king, when he says, When it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, he said, oh, oh, man, he rent his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man to send him to recover, uh, send him to me to recover man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. The king was saying, he's just looking to pick a fight with me. Sent this leper to me, wants me to heal him. How am I going to heal him? And it was so, in verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, he had heard that the king of Israel, see, Elisha was a man of God. The king of Israel was not a man of God. See, religion always goes to the, uh, uh, the works of men. Faith goes to the works of God. Elisha, when he heard about this, heard that the king rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? He said, Don't worry about this. Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. You see, faith knows what God can do. Faith knows what God can do. Elijah wasn't afraid of this, this Naaman. He wasn't afraid of the king of Syria because he was a prophet of God. I think of the scriptures that say, what can man do unto me? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's where Elisha was. So Elisha says, bring him on. And send him my way. I'll take care of him. So listen, here's what happened. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Now, you can just imagine, because I have found out that religion likes 
likes, uh, likes the ceremony. Religion likes the ritual. Come on, I grew up in a church that was very big on rituals and lights and candles. And Naaman probably figured, well, I'm going to go see this man of God. And when he hears I'm coming, he's going to get the incense out and get the candles out. And he's going to put out the, the flowers and put out the, you know, make a, make a big shrine. And we're going to have the big, uh, the big meeting here. And we're, it's just going to be a big, you know, they're going to be, you know, trumpets playing and angels singing and harps playing and the violins going and all that. So Naaman came, stood at the door of the house of Elijah, Elisha, and Elisha didn't even show up. <laughs> he didn't even answer the door. He sent his servant, Gehazi. He says, go tell him this. Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come back to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Go jump in the river. <laughs> and dip. <laughs> Do it seven times. <laughs> and you'll be clean. Well, that's a pretty simple thing to go dip in the river seven times. But it wasn't easy for Naaman because Naaman was a religious fella and he was thinking there was going to be some kind of great, you know, he was, Elisha was going to give him this great, you know, pronouncement. And Elisha just told him, go take a bath. When Naaman heard that, he was not happy. It says that he was wroth and he went away and he said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord's God. You know, big, whoa, you know, big prayer and anointing and everything. And there's going to be this big, uh, big uh, drama going on. And he says, I sh thought surely he would he'd come and, and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. I was looking for the big show. And all he told me, he didn't even come out and see me. He told me to go in the river. He says, are not Abana and Parfar... Uh, Rivers of Damascus. He says, we got better rivers in Syria than the Jordan. Jordan ain't much compared to what we got up there. So if that was the case, I could have jumped in one of them seven times and got clean. I've tried that. It didn't work. He says, are not these rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and he, and he went away in a rage. He's probably thinking to himself, man, when I see that little girl, I'm going to tell her what I think about her prophet. <laughs> and his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, would thou not have done it? You know, if he would have told you to crawl up 500 steps on your knees and say 10 our fathers and tell 10 Hail Marys every step, wouldn't, wouldn't you have done that if you thought it was going to cure you of your leprosy? If he would have told you to hang from a tree and scream like a chair, I mean, what, you know, what, what do you want him to, he would, all you got to do, why don't you try it? It's simple. It's very hard for, for men who, who like to fix things and, and think they have to work their way into things. It's very hard for us to understand the simplicity of the gospel. It's very hard for us to have faith in something that doesn't make any sense to us. It has to be something that, that will, will, you know, make, make sense. Well, do something great. Come on, Elisha. You know, call lightning down. Elijah did that. Interestingly, Elijah called fire down from heaven and nothing happened. Oh, I mean, you know, there was, there was a great uh, thing on Mount Carmel where the sacrifices were taken up, but the people weren't changed. Jezebel, uh, when Elijah had that great miracle on Mount Carmel, he probably figured, oh man, Jezebel's going to be on her face crying out for mercy. Instead, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. You know, we look for the big, we look for the lightning bolt, we look for the earthquake, we look for the, the, the big, you know, thing to come and um, shake the place. When I mean, it's really very simple. They said, Nahum, Naaman, if... You know, if he would have told you to, to, to climb the top of some mountain, you would have said, oh, I'm going to go up, you know. I'm going to go see the Dalai Lama, you know. I'm going to. He said, why don't you just give it a try? So Naaman said, well, I've come this far. Verse 14, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. Guess what happened? He was healed. 
His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now listen. You know, you deal in church as pastors, and many of us have been involved in church and faith and Christianity for a long time. How much of what we hear and see, how, 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 how often, how much of the gospel that we hear is really the gospel? Putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. That's the gospel. It's not church. It's not tithe. It's not money. It's not pray. It, all those things, you know, there are things that are good that we do as, as believers. Things that, that uh, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will pray. We will tithe. We will uh, uh, assemble ourselves with the believers. We'll do all these things. But none of that stuff saves you, and that doesn't make you any more saved than you were when you came to the cross. It'll help you experience a, a greater relationship in, in, in the practical sense. That's very important that we nurture, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's a very important thing. But we're not saved by anything but the blood of Jesus Christ. And faith in that blood. It's simple. It's not always easy. Because we try to make it, man, church, we, we make it a big, long I've said this before, I've used this example before, in the early church, in, in the first century, when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people got saved, what did they do? They baptized them. Saved. About 30, 40 years later, you know what they were doing? They were making them take classes to get baptized. When the church began to get institutionalized, instead of somebody saying, I'm saved, and baptizing they say, well, you got mm, you got to go to our you know, new believers class. And when you complete that, and we fill out your form and give you an A, then we can have a baptism. <laughs> Not only that, but as persecution came to the church, as, 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 as the church began to be persecuted, and the Roman Empire, especially the Romans, they would do horrible things to Christians. And some of the early Christians were able to withstand that and not bow down to the emperor. But there were some who just couldn't, they just gave in. They just couldn't stand the torture. And they were, they were sorry for it. So after the persecution would stop, the ones who gave in, they would come back and ask forgiveness. And they wouldn't let them back in. And the people that endured almost wore that as a badge of pride. Well, I withstood See, it's not about how much you can take. It's about the blood of Jesus. It's about the blood of Christ. Naaman dipped. There's a song. He dipped and he dipped and he dipped. <laughs> okay. okay. Brother Gene Miller sings that song all the time. I don't know him. All right. And he came back and he was clean. Now, look at verse 15. And he returned to the man of God. Man, he was, he was mad, but now that he, he realized he had faith. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know. See, now, now he knew, he heard about it, but now he, he says, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He came from a place up in Syria where they worshipped all different kinds of gods, horrible gods, Baal and Astarte and uh, Rimnon and different gods they would worship. He came and now he said, I realize there's only one God. That's faith. It took this miracle for God to show him who he was. And Naaman had faith. He says, I know there is no God in the earth but in Israel. Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He went back and said, hey, Elisha. Thank you. Here, I brought all this stuff. Take it. I, wanna, I realize you didn't ask for it, but I want to bless you. Here, take it. Gold and silver. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. You mean the gospel is free? You mean I don't have to pay for it? I mean, I believe in tithing and offering. I believe in all those things. But you know what? You can't buy a healing. You can't buy a miracle. You can't buy God's favor. It's only given through faith. And whether you have a million dollars or you don't have two pennies to rub together, your faith can be just as great as any others. 
Would they have an IQ of 200 or 80? It's faith. Whether you come from a, a, a good background or a bad background. Whether, whether yeah, people talk about you good or talk about you. It doesn't matter. It's faith. And, it, and it's not dependent on what anybody thinks about you. It's dependent on what you do with the blood of Jesus. Elisha said, no, no thanks. He says, I, I can't take it. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. What Naaman said, again, now he's coming from a very, you know, a very religious background. He's saying, let me take some dirt from Israel back to Syria. And I'm going to build me a place where I can offer an altar, uh, an, an offering. I can worship God. Now, he didn't have to do that. Again, he's just working from his, from his vantage point. He didn't have to do that. You can worship God anywhere. You don't have to have dirt from Israel. You don't have to have magic stones from the Jordan that you get, you know, from some of these ones that send you. It does. You don't need any of that stuff. But Naaman said, as a token, he said, let me, I want to take two mules worth of dirt back. And in this thing, uh, uh, verse 18, in this thing, the Lord pardoned my servant. Now, now, Naaman is asking for forgiveness that when my master goes into the house of Rim, Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself into the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardoned my servant in this thing. He was saying, listen, I'm going back. I have a king. He worships a, a false god. And sometimes I help him. I, 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 he leans on my, 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 my arm when I take him in the, in, in the temple. If I help him, will God please forgive me? And listen to what? The prophet said, in this thing, uh, in verse 19, and he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. So Naaman, here's Naaman, God is healing, has faith in the God of Israel. He's going back to a place. And I believe, and we don't know this, we never hear of Naaman again. But I believe when he went back to this place, he told people about what God had done. Well, they, they could see it. He was no longer a leper. And he asked forgiveness. He said, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a servant to my king. When he goes and worships in his house, I have to go in with him because I'm required to do that. It didn't mean that he went into worship women. He just went with his king, okay? And I believe Naaman probably, and again, I'm just, this is my conjecture here, that he probably tried to witness this to the God of Israel. And his, his healing was a witness to the God of Israel. Okay, now, now let's go on with this one more, one more uh, just a little bit further. And we're going to close. Look at verse 20. So Naaman left, healed with faith. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Gehazi said, well, Naaman has a lot of stuff. And even though my, my, my master, Elisha, didn't want to cash in, well, hey, I mean, he has his stuff. Maybe I'll just go in and take a little. See, we're getting with a religious spirit now. Because we're always, you know, listen, religion is always looking how we can cash in. Always looking how we can cash in. Yeah, yeah, I know, you know, faith and all this other stuff. But hey, if there's, a, if there's a little bit, maybe I can just snudge a little bit out of it. Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me. Liar. Religion lies. Listen, religion is the biggest liar going. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of prophets. Liar. He's lying. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. What a lie. Make your $333 Jeremiah offering and you'll get everything. You'll be a God-pronounced millionaire. Oh, Saturday afternoon on Christian TV is horrible. Okay. And Naaman said, Take two. 
<laughs> Here, I'll give you more. Yeah, I mean, Naaman would give him the whole bunch. He said, and he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bear him, them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let them go and they departed. Gehazi figured, I'll just take these. I'll just sneak them in the closet somewhere. When Elisha isn't looking, I'll put them up in my room. But he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said, Gehazi, where'd you come from? He knew where he came from. Because if Elisha had enough faith to pronounce healing on Naaman, don't you think he had enough faith to know what was going on behind his back? Man, God knows what's going on behind your back. God knows what's going on behind your back. Sometimes we're not really aware of it, but I'll tell you what, when the time comes, God will let you know what's going on behind your back. He's let me know a few times. God will let you know what's going on behind your back. And it says, uh, verse 25, He went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, That's, I didn't go anywhere. Who, me? And he said unto him, My heart went with you, Gehazi. When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. Now listen, here's what I want to say. You got faith, and you got religion. We're good at religion, but this faith thing sometimes gives us a problem. This is what, listen to what Elisha said to Gehazi. He says, is this a time? Look around you, Gehazi. Look what's going on. Is it really a time for us to try to make a profit off of God's power? You know, God doesn't give us gifts so that we can profit. And the whole thing that's going on around us, you know, we got a world around us that's getting ready for some of the, some of the hardest, most difficult times on this planet. Economically, politically, and we've got people, ministers, pastors, preachers, bishops, blah, talking about getting to be a God-called millionaire. Stupid. They ought to be preparing their people for what's coming. They ought to be preparing their people for the, for the, for the stuff that's happening in this world. That's, it's already washing on our shores and has been for a number, a number of years. We need, as believers, we need to be ready. It's not about how much money we got coming in. It's not about sowing, sowing these, these stupid seeds to, to, so some guy can have a, his own TV network. When, when we, got, we got waves of, 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 uh, of persecution and waves of, of pressure and tribulation coming in. It's happening all over the world. And, and people are blinded. People in the name of Jesus, in the name of the gospel, they're blinded. Talking about driving Mercedes. Talking about they're having their own airplanes. What planet do they live on? What nation do they live in? It's time for us to forget all this religious foolishness and get back to the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if anybody out there is going to get saved, it's, they're not going to get saved by us telling them they can have all, everything they want. Just believe God and He'll give you, uh, just you know, believe God, sow your seed, put your money in, and all the money's going to come in. That's not going to save anybody. Seems to be a pretty lucrative business. But it's not going to save anybody. The only thing that's going to lead people to a saving knowledge is faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Elisha would have none of it. And when his servant tried to cash in, he ended up bearing the leprosy of Naaman. You know, these churches that are trying to cash in, these ministers and these, and these uh, con men. There, I said it that are trying to cash in, they'll cash in all right. And all the trouble and all the, thing is, is, all the stuff that's coming upon the world is going to come on them. As for me, I want to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
As for me, I, I, don't, want, I don't care. I, I, that money isn't going to save me from nothing. God can give us what we need as far as money and gifts. And, and I believe in giving. You all know that. I believe that God blesses our giving. But, but that has nothing to do with salvation. That has nothing to do with the trouble that's coming. We need to have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. To stand on your faith when you get the bad report from the doctor, to stand on faith and say, I believe God's word. It's simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy. When it seems like everything is coming against you, when it seems like, you know, e economy is coming, oh, that's, don't these people see what's going on in the economy? They want to make a bunch of money that doesn't exist. <laughs> They're printing money that doesn't exist. It's all on paper. Lots of money. That money's probably just about as worth as much worth as that. They say, keep printing, keep printing, keep printing, keep printing. Man, I want that money. Money cometh, money cometh. Don't they realize that the time is coming when that money isn't going to be worth the paper it's printed on? Listen, we need to be anchored. This is what Jesus said. He said, those that hear my word and do it, they've built their house upon a rock. If you believe if you have faith to believe what God has said and what God has done, it's like building your house on a rock. The storm's going to come. It's coming. It's here. It's getting worse. But if our faith is built on Christ, we have nothing to fear. But if you build your faith on everything else that we do, even religious stuff, and when the storm comes, it's like my, my brother-in-law lives down in uh, Hampton Roads, down around Virginia Beach, you know. And when we go down there to visit, we go for a ride with him. He'll take us, he'll show us all these beach houses that, that probably cost more than five houses on my block. <laughs> okay. Big, I mean big, uh, these are big places. And they're built right by the ocean. And I'm driving past her and thinking, I said, these people got more money than brains. <laughs> because the next time they have a hurricane, you know, when they have a hurricane, they have that storm surge. I mean, right on the ocean. Some of her build on stilts. And I'm thinking, the next time they have a bad storm, these houses are gone. There's, there's so many people in the church, in the body of Christ, who have built the house on stilts. Not aware that a storm is coming. The perfect storm. It's coming. It's going to come. And only those things that are anchored in Christ will stay. Are you anchored in Christ this morning? Are you anchored in Christ this morning? Is your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ this morning and nothing else? God, help us. Please don't let us become religious. I don't want to become religious. I don't want to make salvation a function of the things that I do. But I never want to miss, I never want to forget that salvation is based on what Jesus did on the cross. Why don't you stand with me as we close in prayer? I want, I want to talk to you if you're afraid this morning. If, if you're here and you see the things that are going on in the world, and you see the things that are going on in your personal world, and you're afraid, it's okay. Don't be afraid to admit, yeah, I'm scared right now. How many people are scared right now? You're just scared at what you see. You're scared at what you hear. You're scared of what you see going on in the news. You're scared of what's going on with your bank account. You're scared of what's going on with the health. You're scared. How many? If you're scared this morning, I want to pray. 
We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. Not some fear, but all fear. I'm not afraid of the Arab Spring. I'm not afraid of the Pakistanis. I'm not afraid of Al-Qaeda. I'm not afraid of the Taliban. I'm not afraid of Fannie Mae or any of those. I'm not afraid of the banks. I'm not afraid of the Federal Reserve Unit. I'm not afraid of... Listen, if I'm, my faith is in Christ, I don't need to be afraid of anything or anybody. Satan is good at trying to make us afraid. Come on, he'll scream at you. He'll cry at you. He'll, 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 he'll try to remind you of every wrong thing you've ever done. He'll try to tell you about every bad consequence that might happen regarding your situation. All those things we turn over in our minds. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Rebuke the devil. Put out the shield of faith that when the fiery darts come at you, put the shield of faith up and block those darts out in the name of Jesus. Have your loins girt about with, with righteousness and the helmet of salvation on your head and your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Put on the whole armor of God. And we'll stand. We'll stand. And he can't make us fall. Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who is a great and mighty God. You're a God who is over all things. Your name is above every name. We thank you, Lord. We don't need to be afraid. Fathers, we prepare to leave this place. I'm just going to sing that chorus one more time. How great is our God as we prepare to leave this place. And I, and, and I, wanna, I always say this. If you need prayer, if you're afraid, you need prayer after we dismiss, please come up and sit up front and I'll be back in. I go back and shake some hands by myself and my wife Rose and Brother Jairus and some of the other brothers here, some of the, uh, other, uh, you know, the other elders and so forth. We'd love to stand and pray with you. Fathers, we prepare to leave this place but not your presence, God. Help us go forth with a new understanding that we don't need to be afraid. Because you're a great God. Father, we give you all praise, honor, and glory. How great is our God.